Welcome back to Games Now lecture series. I'm Anna Kasa Kultima, and this is an open lecture series on game development from Alta University. Obviously, we're not actually at the campus. We are at our own homes with my co lovely co-host, uh, Solid Park. Uh, yeah, again, a new topic for, for the entire lecture series. And uh, well, but first, like, how are you doing, Solid Park? How is, how is life now? Well, still at home, as you can tell, and well, nice and healthy. Yeah. Uh, trying to enjoy my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, we're pretty much kind of not used to everything that, that runs online and this feels very natural. Um, today's topic is super interesting in terms of also having things around you to touch and feel, even though we wouldn't be able to share the spaces now, there is a lot of things that we can maybe uh, still share in a tangible mode. So we have Oz Burak from uh, Tampere University Gamification Group, a researcher and designer looking at the wearables trend. I personally have been looking at this like way back, but I'm so excited to see the, the kind of update of the, the trends, what's out there and what, what kind of cool things we can also dream of doing after all this mayhem of pandemic time. Um, but yeah, I think that Solid, maybe you could introduce some more uh, kind of um, in details of our uh, guest of honor today. Yes, of course. So today we will talk about wearables and how to design a game that use bodily experience and extended reality to engage with future players. And for this topic, which we're very excited about, we have Oz Buruk, aka Oz. Uh, he is currently the Marie Curie Fellow and the Postdoc Researcher at Gamification Group at Tampere University here in Finland. And Oz is expert in industrial product design and game design, and his work are focusing on creating playful interactive environments. And I guess that's actually summarize all the exciting topic that we're going to have for today. So, okay, Oz, without further ado, the stage is yours. Thank you, Solip and Anna Kaisa. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Oz, and uh, let's talk about wearables and how to design them in a playful way today. And let me share my screen, hopefully, with a great success. Let's see. Uh, okay. So, today's Topic is actually try to understand, trying to understand uh, how can we use variables, both for games, but also for creating playful experiences throughout our daily lives and what kind of playful opportunities variables can provide to us. But before going to that, I'm kind of curious what you think when we say variables. I would be really happy if you can put some uh, variables that you can think of immediately when you hear the word variables uh, to the tweet chat. And uh, let's see what this word actually means to all of you. Now, Apple Watch is uh, the first that comes to mind. And of course, I think it's a very, very good variable that can even convince me to change my whole ecosystem. And uh, it's one of the most uh, mainstream ones, let's say. Google Glasses are here, VR headsets, of course, that's also a very good one. Head-mounted displays, again, that uh, goes under the VR headsets. Uh, headsets. Aura Ring, that's a very good example. And a Muse controller, uh, for the ones who doesn't know that Muse controller is a device that just gets your brain signals cat ears <laughs> that's a very good one and yes nintendo uh power glow uh like to, to be more accurate nest power glow which was i think released at uh, 1989 uh, it wasn't by ness but for ness it wasn't that successful at that time because of uh, the technology was not there but maybe we're coming to there. So thanks a lot for that answers. And let me also show you some variables. And I think those variables you already mentioned in the Twitch chat is great. Of course, smartwatches or trackers, I think these are the most popular variables and most accessible variables of today. And other than that, we already, I think, mentioned the Google Glass, and but there are also other types of smart glasses uh, that gives us augmented information 
Uh, we have, yeah, cat ears <laughs> was there, but actually headphones. And I think headphones, although they are the, maybe the oldest ones, are the ones that came to mind uh, at last because they are also wearables. We are wearing them over our ears and carry them on our body, which is kind of the more, more important indicator of being something wearable. Uh, and uh, they are actually an integral part of our lives now with many different types. And of course, we are headsets we already mentioned. And yeah, these are, I think, the first wearables that comes to, comes to mind when we talk about them. But actually, wearables are quite related to self-expression and how we actually try to explain ourselves, the messages that we want to send through our body. And they have actually they are sharing this mutual feature with our clothes. And actually, this also leads to many different and interesting variables, such as Monarch. Monarch is a very interesting variable device. And maybe we can say it's just a kind of an automatic garment that was produced by Social Body Lab. And the thing about that, you can swell your shoulders when you wear it. So you wear it above or under your dress, and then you can use the pneumatic uh, controllers to make them bigger. And then what is really the aim of that wearable there? Actually, it is nothing much than enhancing the ways that we can express ourselves. This is just a social device that we can use. Maybe we are excited about a conversation or maybe we want to intimidate someone and then we swell our shoulders. Um, and actually that might seem useless at the beginning, but it's also showing in an interesting direction how we can think about designing computational materials on our body. And something similar, but maybe even more to the extreme, extreme is the spider dress by Anouk Wiprecht. And maybe it's quite self-explanatory, right? It's basically spider legs that you wear around your neck and shoulders. And it has proximity sensors. If someone gets too close to the wearer, this legs starts moving or intimidating who is too close. And there is also an interesting dialogue between the form and interaction here, because when you look at that dress, it's an intimidating one already, right? You may, you may think twice before approaching a person that wears that kind of spider legs maybe. Uh, and if you thought twice, but you still decided to go and approach, they're actually reacting, please don't, by using proximity sensors and uh, this kinesthetic sculpting over the body. And I hope this give a little bit more information and understanding about how wearables can become a self-expression and in playful ways, because uh, you wouldn't see a, a, a someone every day that wears the spider legs on their shoulders, right? This is really a playful attitude, but that's an attitude I think that also pushes the boundaries of how to produce wearables. Something a bit more conventional is from uh, Google uh, that is called Project Jacquard. And uh, when I checked their website last, they actually expanded their products into different kind of jackets, jackets and also different kind of shoes. Uh, so the idea here is to implement computationality into the look of conventional daily clothing. So here, Google Jacquard actually has this Bluetooth module that connects with the phone, but also has this touch uh, strips here. There are uh, actually conductive threads that can understand how you touch your collar, uh, how, how you touch your sleeve. And by using different kinds of gestures, you can control your phone, maybe you can skip your music. And of course, maybe it's not very revolutionary in terms of interaction design, right? Because now we have tons of devices that we can communicate with our phones. We can use uh, the surface of our headphones. For example, my headphone has a touch uh, pad here that I can use for increasing the sound or decreasing it. Or I don't know, we can also do it through our smartwatches. But the idea here is that they're looking for ways to implement them into the 
look that we are kind of get used to. So it will be more socially acceptable, it will be more fashionable, and it will be preferred by users. So these are some of the variables that I wanted to show you before going ahead to the playful variables, because first I wanted to also strip off the understanding of they are just smartwatches or VR headsets, uh, but they are actually more and they are very related to self-expression. So what about playful variables then? Like what kind of playful variables do we have on the market already? Or do we have some games that directly uses them? And uh, yes, we have. And maybe one of the most popular examples of those was Real Pip-Boy, at least let's say one of the most popular recent examples. Uh, because uh, actually, of course, the NES Power Glow might be more famous than this one. But when Real Pip-Boy, that prop that you wear to your arm released, actually the collector edition of Fallout 4 sold in a very unexpected pace and has been the fastest selling collector edition ever. So it was a big hype. It was a bit then the players were a bit disappointed because the interaction was kind of limited. But still, it was a very interesting and exciting props for everyone because eventually now they could have carry one part of their uh, imaginary character on their body. Another example was Beacon, and I think now it's discontinued. Uh, was a variable that you wear to your feet and then it recognized your feet gestures. So you can map your gestures into keyboard and it will give you eventually like four or five new uh, ways of controlling your games by using your food. Uh, there was interesting applications, for example, when you pitch forward your uh, foot, the character was starting to sprint. But I think and there was an enough uh, maybe demand at that time from the market. But something a little bit more successful than that was the Nintendo Switch Labo Robot Kit. This is a very interesting device. It's basically a cardboard kit that you put your Switch controllers inside and it starts to uh, detect what you do when you pull your string. So when you pull that string like that, then uh, you can punch something in the screen. And this was an interesting implementation and an interesting trial, I think, in the wearables realm uh, and uh, wearables realm of gaming. Still, it was limited to this game only, and uh, there was no further exploration of what we can do with that backpack. And another popular example is the Pokemon Go Plus. Uh, so Pokemon Go was a phenomenon everywhere. everywhere. Uh, and we were quite accustomed to people who walks just looking at their phones and we were immediately guessing that they were playing the Pokemon. But then Nintendo decided to actually release that product also for saving people from looking their phones all the time. So when you have that Pokemon Go Plus, of course you can wear it as a bracelet, but you can also, for example, attach it to your pocket. It warns you when there are Pokemons around and then when you push that button, it catches some Pokemons for you. And these are actually like really the most popular examples that I can show and maybe even the most meaningful uh, ones right now. There are not too much uh, of an exploration in the commercial field right now about wearables, but it's gaining pace. But there are, there are a little bit more in-depth research in indie games area, festival games, or in the research area, and we will mention all of them soon. But let's also see what is there for the extended reality applications, because uh, I think they're also very relevant. And we already mentioned when I asked you about variables that VR headsets are a part of them. And they're actually complemented by other types of devices. For example, this Vujer is an interesting device. Actually, uh, that's a kind of a band that you wear towards your shoulder to, to your uh, waist. and uh, it's actually a subwoofer for your body. So the main idea is not for the games, it's for listening to music and listening to the bass of the music in your body. Uh, but of course, because of the haptic feedback, one of the application areas we're also speculating as we are gaming. Another example is childhood, which is a very interesting one. In that one, the aim is to simulate 
being a child in the VR environment. So basically you are wearing a camera in your waist and you're wearing a hood and hood actually doesn't have any function here. It's just for the transformative purposes because when you wear something, you start a transformation towards that character uh, whose clothes that you're wearing. And in that one, this is a very interesting project because it also has this hand exoskeleton, which is a little bit maybe weird in that sense, but uh, it also tries to make your hands smaller so you can feel the world like an infant. Uh, so basically it's variables for transforming how you perceive your body and uh, tries to create that perception also in your visual understanding through using the virtual reality modalities. Uh, and when we actually switch to the virtual reality, I think one of the interesting things about variables being completely virtual. So leap motion, maybe you know, uh, leap motion was a device that was uh, created for detecting gestures, but then they go went into this virtual uh, reality hand detection. And one of the applications was creating virtual variables that will surround your body in that augmented layer. And another interesting project that I can show you is face touch and face display. Uh, and basically, there is a VR glass, but there are also this touch displays on that VR glass, so people can and touch your game and give inputs to your game. And this creates some kind of asymmetric interaction between co-located players in the VR environment. But also in the XR environment, let's say a deep exploration of what variables can bring to there, it didn't go too far yet. So then I have mentioned some examples, but I also said that uh, maybe we are not too far into there yet. Uh, but then how can we understand how to design variables for playfulness? So to answer this question, uh, we created that design framework for playful variables uh, together with Catherine Espester from University of California, Santa Cruz, and Teresa Jean Tannenbaum uh, from Irvine. And we have actually based our exploration on four projects that we have created before. And this framework is actually created uh, based on our hands-on ex experience, both designing and testing, but also playing those kinds of games that is supported by wearables. And now I will mention those different dimensions that we have found. And hopefully after mentioning those, you will also have a better understanding what wearables can bring into the playfulness realm. So design framework for playful variables actually examines variables through three different planes. Uh, the first one is of course a performative plane, the second is a social, and the third is the interactive plane. So let's go and deep dive into these planes a little bit more to see uh, what they mean. So actually performative plane uh, is about the self-expression and identity of players. As I said in the beginning, the variables are really related to self-expression. And that might be even more true for games because in games, uh, immersion and character identification is one of the critical and key experiences. So while playing games, maybe in every media it is like that, but especially while playing games, we directly replace ourselves uh, with the character that we're playing in most of the time. And variables can be also key that goes to that direction. So in that performance plane, we have a spectrum called imaginary and immersive. And in the imaginary part, we mean that uh, actual variables uh, can be designed in a way that will leave some imagination points to the player. So you can design maybe variables partially and the players can start imagining the rest of their bodies by themselves. But you can also create variables that will put you into that world uh, without any question at, questions asked. Of course, you will still imagine a new world, but they will be more dedicated 
for you to be inside of that different clothes. So let's also examine that in a more closer way. We have actually three more sub dimensions to here. So for example, we can design variables as accessories, right? The smartwatches or uh, bracelets or necklaces or rings are in that category. And especially when we think about the games part of it, when we wear something, and if it just covers a small part of your body, then we leave player to imagine the other parts of their body. And this might be, of course, uh, very advantageous in, in some kind of contexts, but maybe a more costume-like approach can be preferable in other types of concept, uh, contexts. So in costumes part, we actually can design costumes uh, that can cover most of our body. And this will also put us into a stance of a more transformative process that we are becoming something else, but also can give a message to the players or to other people outside. And they, when they see us, they can understand that we are now into a process of transformation and role playing. And yeah, I, I mean, in this framework is pretty straightforward. If your designs are more closer to here, then we are assuming that they're more closer to the imaginary part. But if the designs are more closer to the costumes part, they are more towards the immersive part. And maybe you can understand the others a lot more easier. So abstract means that the look of the variable can be interpreted in many different ways while exact uh, actually is a very well-defined design that will uh, reflect the world that we are playing in. And customized and dedicated, I think also quite self-explanatory. Uh, in the customized part, you can have a more user intervention how this variable will work and look while in dedicated part, it's already pre-designed and there is not too much place for intervention. So actually this framework is used by us by really uh, putting those sliders into the different parts while analyzing our games or while talking about our games. And this will, for example, give an uh, kind of an average of that that puts it into a little bit more immersive side. But please don't take this as a mathematical framework. This is, this is an inspirational framework. We are not trying to gauge and measure if something is more closer to costumes or accessories. But what we are trying to do is to ignite people to think, OK, what happens if I go a little bit more on the costume side or in the accessories side? And if we give that framework to different people for analyzing the same game, I'm sure that there will be different results. But this is more about defining the boundaries, showing the possible design space that designers can move into and uh, try to, trying to explain them uh, the possibilities that they can find and implement in their variables. In the second part, we had a social plane. We also uh, claim that variables can intrinsically uh, support co-located social interaction between players. And it can do it in, in two ways, either as a relaxed way or in a more tight way. So when you think about relaxed, it actually mentions more of a distant interaction. So maybe your variables has some colors or maybe a Morse code that everyone can see from the distant and you can provide communication to them from uh, that distant space. But maybe your variables have some kind of touch areas that needs to be touched by other players that will encourage them to more closer social interaction. So you can see that one is still social interaction, but in a more distant way, and one, one is a more tighter uh, tighter social interaction. And in that sense, you can also think about more independent play that everyone has variables and still in social interaction, but their actions are not dependent to each other. But in the interdependent part, variables can be designed in a way that will encourage people to work together while playing a game. And especially in that part, you may ask, this can be true for any kinds of games, right? Like when you think about a massive, uh, online uh, multiplayer game, 
a lot of players while playing them are interdependent to each other to achieve achieve their goals. But here, maybe you should think that variables are more about bodily and co-located interactions when it comes to social gaming. It, they can do the same thing that might be needed uh, need to be done in these digital and virtual worlds in the real life. And I will show you some examples how interdependency or independency can work in terms of social context with variables. And as you can see here, it can be a more of a verbal interaction or a bodily interaction. When we come to the interactive plane, uh, it is again in the spectrum, it might promise an interaction with your surroundings, uh, maybe with a more bodily expressions, but it can also be around the artifacts. So the interaction can be focused to wearable itself and because of the, it can focus on body. And I think one of the most important things here, when we say wearables, the first in interaction modalities that comes to mind, comes to mind are embodied interaction uh, and also embedded interactions such as, for example, collecting heart rate data or other types of body data, or as I said, like the movement tracking and gestures. But actually they also give a lot more, inter uh, a lot more interesting and wider spectrum of interactions such as tangible interaction. I will also show some examples, but imagine that your variables have tangible parts that you may take out or, and put maybe somewhere else in your body and actually they may guide really different types of bodily explorations through also tangible interactions. And uh, again, as you might see here, this framework uh, can shift to peripheral, uh, peripheral or artifact oriented interactions here. So let's go and understand uh, then what might be more into this framework. Actually, what we have also done with the framework is intersecting all those different planes to create a 3D plane to define where our games can be situated. For example, we have analyzed Lobo Robot Kit and decided that it is somewhere here, more closer to peripheral relaxed interaction, and it is more in the immersive side. And now I think the most important question about that framework is then how may designers use this? And now, while I'm trying to explain that to you, I will also show you some interesting gaming wearable projects that we have worked on so far. So you will be also introduced to those uh, and ho I hope they will also inspire you to maybe create wearables for your projects or trying to design games that can revolve around wearables. The first project that I will mention is social wearables for LARP and that was produced in Social Emotional Technology Lab in University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, led, by, uh, led by Catherine Espister. And Elena, uh, Elena Marquez Segura was leading that project. And that's an actually very simple, but a very interesting project. In that one, uh, they deployed this uh, very, very simple other fruit circuit playground uh, trinket to players and they could have actually uh, arranged them to show their health level in the game. And they, will, they also gave that strips that shows the energy of the imaginary character that can be filled when someone comes and reassures you by patting your shoulder. So we have used our framework for analyzing what is uh, social variables for LARP because we wanted to understand if we can use that framework as a mutual vocabulary that we can talk through to other people about what our variables are doing. So in that sense, when we first look at to the performative plane, it is more of an accessory. Uh, and there was actually a kind of a, uh, like an intention of designers to make that as accessories because this was designed for LARP and LARP players uh, can come to LARP games with very good costumes that they prepared uh, in a very long time. So they don't want to mess up with that by creating intrusive variables. So whatever you wear, whatever costume you wear, you can still attach those variables on top of that. 
And you can see that it is more on the abstract side because we already checked in the previous slides that uh, this is basically really a circuit uh, and a microcontroller. So it is more in the abstract side, but it's not completely abstract because it actually fit into the game world. In the game world, the players who wore them was also kind of cyborgs. So this look, even if it is not, if it, even it was designed in an abstract way, didn't look too abstract in the game because it was placed into the game world in a right way. And of course, it can be still customized or dedicated. And it wasn't designed again in a customized way, but since it is open, you can do many things with that. Maybe you can put a shell on top of it. Uh, you can try to adorn it with different kinds of materials. So it is open to customization. When it has come to uh, the social plane, you can also see that it is more in the relaxed side because most of the things that happen in the game was conversations around that health level. So if your health is low, then players were coming and asking what happened to you, where did you hurt yourself? And uh, again, even if your energy level is low, then they were talking about the reasons maybe behind that. And even in one of the scenarios, they improvised this as one of the problems of a cyborg that's breaking down. And in an imaginary surgery, they took out uh, the device from the chest of the character. So it was just a very simple device, but it created a lot of different interactions uh, in the game world. Of course, there is also a bodily component to it, as you can see here, and it is also um, encouraged, it also encourages a little bit more closer interaction because when you go and touch someone, you can actually uh, increase their energy. And again, we can also see that there is not too much of a, a bodily enactment encouragement here. It's more of a symbolic device that uh, you can interact with an artifact-oriented approach. So that was social variables for LARP. And another example that I want to show you uh, is, is WearPG. So WearPG was produced in Koch University Archetic Research Center for Creative Industries. And uh, I am one of the designers of that project. And it is actually an augmented tabletop game. And that's played by using variables and movement. So for the ones who doesn't know what a tabletop role-playing game is, I will explain uh, briefly. Uh, tabletop role-playing games are usually played around a table, as you may have guessed, and uh, consists of several players. One of those players is usually a game master that tells a story and moderates the game, and other players are actually reacting to the, this story to achieve their goals. And when they want to perform an action in the game, they have to roll a randomizer, which is usually a dice, but it can be cards in some of the contexts. According to the outcome of that dice, they decide um, what is the outcome and what is the scenario is, is uh, going on right now. So for example, if you wanna shoot something in the game and you roll a one out of 20, then most probably you miss it very badly. Of course, it can be also accompanied by different kind of uh, materials such as character sheets, boards, and grids. And uh, in the character sheets, there are a load of character information such as uh, the skills, health information, races, and classes. And in boards, it is usually used for depicting the imaginary world a little bit more better to the players. So what is different about WearPG? In WearPG, we wanted to add some uh, more body movements into that and more costuming experiences and decided that gauntlets. And with that gauntlets, before rolling the dice, you first play a movement-based game. And according to your success in that movement-based game, the probabilities in your dice 
change. So if you're successful, you have more green faces. And if you're unsuccessful in the game, you have more red faces. In that way, we're still maintaining the chance element in the game, which is very important uh, for players. But we also add a new mechanic that you can manipulate your chance. And afterwards, as in other uh, game, role-playing games, you roll your dice. And there are seven different games that is loaded into that gauntlet that you can play in different kind of scenarios. So for example, if you want to shoot an arrow, you can play, uh, play one of the precision games. If you want to hit or break something, you can try it with power games. Or if you want to cast a spell, then you can go and play concentration games. So that was the RPG, and this is a little um, footage from its gameplay sessions. So in that one, the player uh, shoots with an arrow, and it was successful. So you may have realized that actually uh, I, ha I have mentioned from that game a little bit more than the others because uh, this was actually my PhD project. And uh, this was the day that I graduated from PhD at that time. Uh, it was an exciting day, of course. And in Turkey, we don't get hats or swords like as in Finland, but then I had my dragons and my weird wearable devices, which was also, I think, a pretty good addition to my uh, graduation costume. And I actually waited for that abbreviation for a year, which actually means Doctor and Dragons in that sense. And yeah, it was a pretty good moment. And it also felt good to wear that weird device that is supposedly to come from another world. And that understanding was also shared by players. I mean, some of them, of course, uh, ask us like how to buy it, but it's a research project. So uh, it's not sold. But what is really more important that a lot of players were really uh, in the experience that we want to, them to uh, somehow feel. For example, uh, one of the players said that they felt as if their arm is in another game's world. And it was pretty interesting because one of the things that we wanted to do with that game uh, was to create that connection between the imaginary world, imaginary character, and the player uh, but it also supports how we have framed our planes because the player mentioned like that the arm was somehow uh, was part of that world. And of course, uh, you still imagine the rest of your body in that imaginary world, but this physical connection that already exists actually boosts that uh, in different ways. So we use our framework in the RPG in a, in a little bit more critical way. So we wanted to understand if there are ways that we can improve it and if there are missed opportunities. And one of the things that we realized that the RPG was a little bit too customizable. As you can see here, it's really in the customized side. And this customization was quite nice actually for players because uh, they could have designed anything they want. Like some of them designed this knuckle type of variable. Some of them designed these gorgeous gauntlets. And then when they level up in the game, we were giving them more hexagons so they can improve their variables to show their level in the game. And actually this was a pretty good game mechanic also for them and they liked that. But for us, it was a bit challenging because as you can see here, we have sensors here in, in, in that box. And when it is that customizable, you cannot know where this box is. And because of that, we have to design our games in more of a superficial way. So we have looked in the motion data, but we didn't make any kind of really pre precise measuring of them. 
but we try to understand the threshold something can go above and low and we try we, uh, we try to decide according to that if we had make it a bit more less customizable this would help us in a development process but another good thing i think would be this would also help us players to reflect themselves better because in that game you could have chosen uh, elements according to the characters that you want to play and all these elements give you different kinds of powers uh, but as you have said although you can create different kind of form factors with those hexagons their visual language is really similar to each other so there is not there wasn't enough room for players to differentiate from each other and express themselves so a little bit more less customization and more pre-made designed uh, parts that would indicate different kinds of classes might work better even uh, for the game experience. Let's go to another project and it, it is called Maja Transformo and it was made by the Transformative Play Lab in University of California, Irvine. And Teresa Jean Tanenbaum was involved in the design of that, one of the creator, creators of the framework. And let's see a, a short video of how, how it is played. So, that is Maja Transformo. And it is actually a dance of transformation game. So basically it's a dance game that you try to create different kind of spells around that cauldron. And I can go to more of the uh, action part of it. So in that game, people are dancing around that cauldron, telling spell words, and according to the costume they choose, they have different kind of spells. And there is also a technical part of it, because as you may, might have seen here, uh, there is this connect sensor at top, and it actually follows the colors of the wearables. So wearables are here a very interesting item that's work both in a technical level of the game but also connects player to the imaginary world and the narrative sphere of the game. So in Magic Transformer, we wanted to re-envision the game a little bit more uh, different way, especially in the social part. It was a very social game and you have to be close to each other so the dance works, but uh, there wasn't any physical connection between players. And we were kind of curious if we can alter that to somehow also encourage players to hold their hands, maybe for creating a stronger energy and a better group cohesion while playing the game. And these kind of dances are also quite common that you hold your hands and play around a cauldron. That, that might be a new way of experiencing the game uh, compared to the version that you look at the book and tell the words. Of course, these are speculations and under, uh, kind of experimentations throughout the uh, framework, and we can never know without testing them if they would work nicely. But I'm trying to demonstrate to you how the framework worked in our design process. And also from the performative side, I think it was a very immersive game because you were wearing all those different kind of costumes, robes and hats, and you go into that cauldron, which also creates a whole new world experience for you. But maybe like shifting it a little bit more towards the customized size by allowing players to bring their maybe old trinkets or their different kind of jewelries that to put around their robes and hats might also position them as unique wizards while still maintaining the other uh, important parts of the game, such as choosing your wearable and choosing your skill according to that, and of course on the technical level, still maintaining the colors of wearables without ruining them too much. So when we altered uh, Magic Transformer, it was more here in the plane, uh, in the in the space, and then it moved and expanded a little bit more toward tight side and imaginary side of those different planes. And the last game I will mention is Hotaru, which is by Kaho Abe. And Hotaru is a very interesting game uh, because it's actually one of the 
first examples of using variables and looking at variables in a way, in a more critical way to understand what they can bring into gaming. Uh, and it was again, uh, the research part of it was done by Catherine Espister. So here uh, you can see the Hotoru and it's actually a very gorgeous gauntlet which is designed very well and the backpack. And in that game, one of the players co collecting energy around the world by doing some gestures and then they have to come together and hold their hands. And when they transfer the energy from the backpack to the gauntlet, then they can shoot the things, uh, the en enemies that lives in that imaginary world. And I will also show you a small video of it. And that the, uh, this game has been shown in, in many of the places and has been used in different parts of uh, doing the research, especially regarding interdependency in games. So as you can see here now, this uh, child collecting all the information comes here. And maybe that's uh, even a better shoot of how it works. So you're collecting it. And now they're holding hands. Now it's in the gauntlet. And when it is full in the gauntlet, they can make the action. Uh, so what is really... Of course, it's a very, uh, that's a repetitive game, and it's, it's designed for uh, festival experiences. But you can also see that how they're here try to shake their hands while the energy is transferring, and how they can somehow transform their all body modalities into something that is imaginary. Because all of those are actually roles, like no, nothing like that is happening uh, in a very strong way to encourage them to shake their hands. So what we have done in Hotaru, we have decided to go with a little bit more experimental approach when we are redesigning the Hotaru. So as you have seen here, it is a lot more in the interdependent side because uh, of course there is some independent side that each player goes and, and collect energy but then they have to come together and hold their hands. And then this energy should go from one backpack to other gauntlet. And, and this just happens because of this mechanism. Like you have to hold your hands for this game to work. And that's a very simple mechanism that affords players to go and try these different interactions. So, but we wanted to understand what happens if we go a little bit more crazier here in the framework. So we focused on the social aspect, which was most one of the most important parts of Hotaru. And we wanted to shift those sliders towards distant and verbal parts. But we still wanted to keep inter interdependent part here uh, because interdependence was really important. But we asked ourselves, because distant and verbal seemed a little bit more harder to achieve while still retaining the interdependency. And we wanted to think if we can still do that. And at the end of the day, we decided what happens if we can add some tangible parts that can be taken out of the gauntlet here, and maybe they're spread around the world. So instead of going and doing gestures, you the one with the backpack, which is the energy harvester, needs to go around and seek those. And when this player comes closer to these parts, in the gauntlet player, there will be some vibrations. So they will talk to each other. Maybe the gauntlet player will tell, okay, now you're close to one of the parts, please go towards that direction. 
So this is how we envisioned new verbal interaction uh, into the game. And then when it is all collected, they can come together and they can put all those different aspects uh, into the uh, gauntlet to build the gauntlet from a broken state. And then they can repeat the core part of the game again. And they, then they can hold hands and uh, transfer the energy and hit uh, the enemies there. I think it was an interesting intervention because we tried to make an experimentation to see if it will work or if it will be something ridiculous. But the result that happens, I think, was interesting because it was adding new elements that will also remove the repetitiveness of always holding uh, hands, uh, doing, doing the gesture and holding hands and doing the gestures and holding hands instead of it leaves holding the hand to the end of the interaction, which will maybe give more importance to that. Of course, this is still a game that is for festivals and it, it is interesting to see where we can get it uh, when it comes to ma mainstream gaming. So in Hotoru's uh, side, it's somehow changed dramatically because it really jumped from the tight parts of the social interaction and came here a little bit more to the relaxed side while retaining some of the tight aspects of that social interaction. So at the end of the day, uh, when we first took our games, they were contemplating a, play, a space like that in our design space, but then they actually came a little bit towards the middle of every dimension. And I think that's also an interesting point. Why did they come to that middle? Is, it, is the middle is the best place to come? Is it the, like an ideal combination of features? Uh, and if every designer should try to incorporate different aspects from each side? My answer to that is no. The reason why it happened like that, because we designed the framework based on those projects. So it is kind of normal that those projects were at different extreme ends at the beginning. But then we wanted to also experiment with the framework in different ways to understand how it can in incorporate different features from maybe each side. So, as a result of our intervention and our personal experience as design researchers, we have come up with that picture, but it might be different. And this framework doesn't promote one side as better than the other side. It just tries to expand the opportunities and show different kinds of possibilities that variables can bring to playing. And uh, as I said, in each of the extremes, there are interesting choices, there are interesting experiences to be created depending on the context. So this was the design framework for playful variables, but where do we go from here? Then what is in the future? Let's talk about that a little bit. So while talking about that, I will also introduce maybe some of the research projects that we are working on right now, uh, and also bring you more examples from the commercial side, maybe not immediately related to games, but examples that games can be beneficial to. So let's go back to RPG. In RPG, I put those variables to our fellow role-playing gamers and I had to take the risk of ruining their one beautiful hobby. Why did I do that? Why did I take the risk? I, take, I took the risk because the, I was and some other researchers before me thinking that creating this physical artifact that bonds you with your imaginary character can actually strengthen that connection between you and your avatar. And I think I saw that uh, also in my tests that it was the case. Most of the players really like uh, to play uh, with the, those variables. Of course, some didn't like, because it's also true that when you put those, uh, you're also maybe restricting them a little bit uh, because you're forcing them to do maybe some kind of movement, some kind of movements, 
and uh, also maybe you're putting them into a very specific world. Uh, but still, a lot of players were also quite happy because it successfully connected them to their imaginary character in a better way. So, as we have said in the beginning, it was more about self-expression and expressing yourself in, in the shoes of your characters. It's more about identifying yourself with those. And this practice actually also brings cosplay to our world, which is a very interesting practice that can shape how we also design wearables maybe in the future. Cosplay is a practice that uh, you take the clothes, let's say not the costumes, but the clothes of characters that live in different worlds and bring them to our world. There are really interesting and fun examples too, such as that one, for example, or those ones. There is this cheap cosplay that I really love. And uh, it, it's, it's for everyone, but it's more about transforming yourself into another character. And what is, I think, really interesting about cosplay, it brings the aesthetics and understandings of worlds whose social norms, social acceptances, even the physical realities are completely different than our current world. And actually these are kind of the aesthetic reflections of those different imaginary worlds on, uh, on, on, on the clothes that we may use while designing smart uh, garments. That's quite interesting to me. And of course, I'm not suggesting, suggesting to take some costume from a, a Marvel universe and use it as a daily clothing. But I think it's very interesting to look at those to understand what they can bring, what kind of magical interactions we can learn from them and use them in our daily life clothing. So in that sense, I think cosplay and self-expression and Above all, this playful attitude of designing things can also give hints us about how to design wearables. Another thing here that we are now doing in our uh, research team uh, is to understand how can playfulness be manifested in the data smart clothes. We are working on that project to, together with in the uh, Intelligent Clothing Group led by Johanna Wilke in Tampere University and with PhD students Shiva Jabari and Asif Shai. And we're trying to understand how, what kind of dimensions of playfulness can be used while designing our data smart clothes. And I find this topic very fascinating and I'm very excited to come up with concrete results. What will they be? Uh, what we can learn from playful attitude and game worlds uh, that can be transferred into our data lives. Another project that we're working on with uh, Rove Xiao and Sangwon Jung uh, mainly is how can we design playful variables for mainstream gaming? And I think that's maybe one of your questions. So where it goes in the mainstream gaming? In my opinion, it's still uh, in the kind of in the beginning phase, let's say. It's inching towards maturity. And there is a lot of uh, steps that should be taken before we see variables as a more integral part of gaming. But I will show you one interesting example in that sense. It is that Adidas GMR, G GMR pack. And that's a very, very interesting project. That is basically a shoe sole that you put this electronic device and it measures your activity throughout the day. And through that measuring, it gives you some kind of points. Then you can go and use those points in FIFA for improving your character. And this was actually one of the good and interesting ideas we also came up with in the Garment project. Uh, with the input of a lot of different stakeholders, experts, and users. And we also come up that this might be an interesting way to bridge our daily gaming habits to our other parts of our data life. In the Adidas case, 
it's more about exercise. They are trying to bridge and connect exercise uh, to the daily life, uh, the daily life of the exercise of the daily life to the sports games. But we are very curious what can be the other ways of doing that. It's not only about the exercise. We have a lot of different habits and we have a lot of different things that we're doing. And of course, with examples such as again Pokemon Go, games can be a very integrated part of our of our lives. But we're curious what how also the games that we play at home can be part of our data lives. Uh, can we use them for creating uh, better interactions in the data life, or can we use them for promoting well-being uh, while still keeping the enjoyment that games brings to us uh, in our homes, let's say? And why I'm actually pressing on the homes there. Because again, I think the most advanced gaming systems and most advanced games are still designed for maybe consoles, PCs, and to some extent to mobile devices. Uh, but we can also go beyond that simple gamification applications that just gives us leaderboards or badges, but we can try to find ways to integrate them, to integrate them in a better way to the games that we enjoy every day. And I think that's a very good step that's taken towards there. And considering that Adidas was part of it, I also want to speculate that this will pick up more and will bring more interesting examples to our daily lives. Another thing that of course we are working on, how can we design playful variables for extended reality environments? And uh, when it comes to extended reality environments, there are a lot of new aspects because we are adding the augmented layer to the existing clothing. Then we can ask ourselves what this augmented uh, layer can bring about self-expression. And one of the things that comes to my mind and of, of course also our player's mind was virtual costumes. So we could have used those variables as costumes that would transform you in the virtual world, but maybe transform you partially in the real world. Other things included changing your body perception in the virtual reality through different kinds of interventions, for example, making your body uh, more heavier or lighter or trying to make you feel more fatigued, that kind of different changes in inducing the perception of different kinds of experiences. And another thing was using the around body as a space for virtual interaction with physical devices. And again, in the industry, there are interesting things happening in terms of virtual reality. And this last example that I want to show you is the Fabricant. Fabricant is a very interesting company. It's a digital only fashion company. And those clothes can be used and traded in virtual realities. And the things that you see here are virtual clothes. And I think that's very interesting and somehow a little bit fascinating to me how we have quickly shifted from uh, making, our wear, making our clothes computational interactive to making them fully digital and virtual. And I'm very curious about what will be the dialogue between our physical clothes and virtual clothes. How does it feel to wear something different but then see something different in other worlds? Or how does it feel to wear partial clothes that can be completed in the virtual world? And especially when it comes to virtual realities, I think the industry ha has a lot of to learn from games and the aesthetics of games in terms of designing clothing. And I'm very excited about those aspects. I think it is just picking up. And the era that we are in right now is also a very exciting era for playful variables because playful variables, I think, will not remain only as part of games but they will be inspirational to the clothes that we are wearing in our 
physical realities or in our virtual realities. This was my presentation today, and I hope all the examples and uh, the information about how to design variables inspired you to maybe work on that area or uh, maybe modify your existing games towards here a little bit. But I'm really excited to hear your further questions about a topic and more discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Oz. That was uh, amazing and super inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, I think that I could uh, start with a question uh, for you. Uh, just a very basic one. How did you end up choosing variables as your PhD <laughs> project? I think that's a that's a very good question. And uh, I don't know, maybe most of the PhD topics, it was a bit of a coincidence. Uh, because I was working on double-sided displays uh, and we were quite excited about what we can do with what double-sided displays. One of the things that comes to my mind was using it as a interface for role-playing games, because in role-playing games, you have two different roles. One is the game master and the other is the players. And usually those two different audiences should see different things. So this is how I came to the role-playing games. But then ideating about how to actually control those games I came up with the variable idea that I got mm. excited a lot because of how they can be translated into costumes and in a context like role-playing, how they can really add to the experience of players in terms of combi like bounding them to their imaginary characters. Um, and yeah, that's, that's why I really wanted to start doing that and test that. And then I realized a few more people also told that variables can be really effective as costumes. And I was, okay, let's, let's <laughs> do it and try that. Yeah, uh, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, interesting things that I could tackle into your, in your lecture. I think that Solip might be picking some of the questions from the audience, but I would like to, now that we are in this situation, which is pretty different from the world that we used to be in, from your point of view, how has COVID affected the because it's like, it's actually, it's, it's nice that you started with the, the spider example, because it kind of made me think that we're not out of this tangible uh, kind of world of wearables, but we could kind of actually be even more using them because of the, even like post-pandemic uh, world. Yeah. So yeah. What, what is your per point of uh, perspective for, for the, how the pandemic has been changing the field? Uh, I think, of course, one of the things about the pandemic is the masks, right? I mean, uh, it was so interesting for me to observe the social acceptance level of how, how we are reacting to masks in our culture. Because yeah. masks are usually associated with not, not very uh, pleasant experiences. And uh, they are actually symb symbolizing, uh, in the Western culture, let's say, they are symbolizing, uh, like, for example, thieves. Let's say this is one of their uh, sim sim mm. symbols that they've uh, yep. put in their face. But now it's all, all, all different. Now the, it's changed. Now the accepted norm is wearing the masks. Yeah. And in that sense, when it comes to wearables, then I believe that it also pushed our understanding of how social acceptance can change around different kind of things that we, we wear. Yeah. For example, I'm so curious what happens now if I wear a VR glass and starts to go shopping with that every day. What happens, <laughs> how they will react after yeah. that? Maybe they will thought that it's an extension of my mask. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and maybe it's a new type of mask. I don't know. And I think this will affect in that side. But also, as, as the example that I showed, I'm kind of curious how, will, how it will affect the tangible side of it. The mm. fabricant is this digital-only couture uh, fashion house. It's incredible that they are making this virtual clothes and they're selling them to the, mm. in, in turn of a real money to people who want to wear them in the virtual world. And now we have pushed ourselves in a very quick way to become fully virtual. And I'm kind of not curious what is the dialogue between those because before I was thinking it will be a dialogue between physical and virtual for sure, but now I'm not sure if it will again 
the physical part will be as strong as the previous one. Or yeah. maybe it will maybe it will be even more stronger because we mm. will need it artificially in our homes mm. that we have to touch things and feel the change of this tangibility and tactility. Yeah. I'm also thinking myself that maybe since kind of we haven't been into social spaces that much, maybe the kind of um, the social aspects of showing something really interesting and having this uh, amazing opportunity to show your body in an interesting way with the wearable yeah. or like for instance the cat uh, ears or mm-hmm. or these kind of things will, will they become a bit more socially accepted because uh, it is so precious now to kind yeah. of have have your body transformed into a physical space and not yeah. just a digital space i wonder if we would uh, be more accepted uh, with the playful notes of of kind mm. of, uh, actually, I don't know, masks already bring that a bit because you can give mm. a bit playful things even with prints yeah. without uh, digital technologies. But yeah, it's just super amazing to think about, for instance, the spider legs mm. pushing people a bit farther away <laughs> because it's like even in the outside of the streets here in Helsinki, people are just really close to you okay. even though they wouldn't <laughs> wear masks. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if that that th- those kind of things that we can kind of uh, mm-hmm. have and, and and emphasize the the social aspects of of uh, engagement outside, uh, but also with, with digital things because it's kind of becoming yeah. more accepted now that we've done this like huge digital leap with everybody as well. So mm-hmm. having the maybe integrated style between your virtual appearance in in places like this or in yeah. the in outside and like how to have the combination of whether the mm. fashion will accompany you like when i buy something i will get also the virtual dress of that i don't yeah. know yeah there's I, so I, many things uh, that's pretty interesting because uh, now our reality also changed right for example last for the last two years uh, I don't know what happened to time, for example. My time perception definitely changed according to what it was before. Yeah. And my reality starts to change with that a little bit. And if, if virtual reality also, and it's still at least the investments and the applications show that uh, virtual reality uh, applications also starts to become something more uh, common than before, mm. then how these different realities will affect each other. Maybe as, as Fabricant does, maybe some flamboyant and extreme uh, yeah. looking uh, kind of dress will be acceptable in that virtual world, but maybe yeah. there will be reflections back to the real life then because yeah, indeed. we will already be accustomed to that there. And yeah. now we can also use it here. So I think, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting times for uh, variables to thrive and very interesting developments are happening. Yeah. Exactly. One comment for that spider clothes. Uh, uh, I couldn't stop thinking about StarCraft, which is oh, a yeah. huge fan of. I was Kerrigan. like, oh my god, that looks so cool. <laughs> I want to wear it. You know? yeah. And it kind of also represent, you know, how uh, there were a lot of questions from the audience so far, whether wearables can go mainstream mm. or whether it can be accepted. But I guess in certain degrees, you already showed us quite a lot of examples that maybe we are ready to accept this um the another side would be like economic reason like prices of wearable and things like that yeah. um so how do you see the future of wearables now that mm-hmm. especially in covid19 do you think people are more acceptable to this type of mm-hmm. mix of reality now uh i mean from the context of covid uh i don't know if i can add anything to the things that i just said in the in the mm-hmm. previous question but at the other side i think yes uh, we're coming closer to there because variables are quite complicated and of course they're not new like there has been research for 30 years on them but still especially from the commercial side it is hard to you know establish um habits around that no mm-hmm. one was charging their watches before right now you have to create that solution that will uh, encourage people to take their watches from their wrists and put it to the charging and then wear it again at the other day so and there are a lot of now different types of apple watch straps that allows you to do it quickly and easily Mm -hmm. compared to a traditional watch for example 
And uh, these are the questions. And we were, for example, trying to develop and trying to understand how we can integrate variables into mainstreaming, mainstream gaming. And mm. I think one of the biggest challenges is that player it's hard to encourage players to wear something on the while they're playing games and then take off this thing when they stop playing games mm -hmm. um, because it's i think already a challenge to open your console and wait for games and even new consoles are working on that right you have to go on immediately without any pause mm -hmm. so but in that era now we're trying we're starting to solve all those problems and one of the solutions that we also come up with that even if it's a game variable, it should be something that are worn maybe throughout the day. So you don't use it for only playing games, but you're actually making your whole daily life more playful mm. and more fun, but you also still use it in your game in a more meaningful way. So uh, those were the parts uh, that we have come up with. And I think with more efforts, uh, to, in nowadays commercial fields, I think gaming variables are also uh, more likely to become widespread in, in the next years. Mm. I also wonder, like, what what is your take on like uh, do-it-yourself kits that would that mm. there's a lot of like, and one of the reasons why there is a bit more this artistic maybe festival projects because it has become so accept, um, accessible for different kinds of artists to work with sensors. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder if the, the commercial mm -hmm. side is a bit because of the same with the with the um, uh, switches kit with the cardboard things is a bit more that it's there is the maker or do it yourself culture behind that. So what is yeah. your take on on that part that we could create our own stuff? Yeah, I think that that will also play an important role in uh, variables becoming mainstream. Because I have mentioned a lot of dimensions, right? I have mentioned a lot of input modalities, a lot of different experiences that they can create. So someone should start exploring them and see how they change playing games. But it's, I think, very hard to do from the commercial side because game industry is also is not a very, let's say, flexible one, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a very big operation. You cannot change all your... Uh, controllers and you cannot innovate every day about what to do. Like maybe Nintendo is doing it a lot compared to the other other sites. Uh, and I think this is why also they come up with this new kind of kits and do it yourself because then you have a lot of people exploring it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are starting to explore what kind of different interactions I can have with Joy-Cons. Uh, because this Joy-Con cardboard kits are not fixed. You can customize them. You can reprogram them through their uh, applications. And I think same approach would be also beneficial for gaming variables. If we can, instead of trying, instead of waiting for games that will be released that is adapted to variables, if we can design variables that easily can be adaptable to different kinds of games in different ways, then we can also see the potential easier. Mm. I can I can definitely see the potential with uh, the the games like Pokemon Go that you would still have, like you would have a bit of a cost, uh, uh, like costume ish ways of playing when you mm -hmm. go around that they would be a bit more performative as well uh, yeah. depending so... on the I don't know like so if one of your favorite games maybe to go around and cosplay <laughs> out mm -hmm. in the wild without being on a con for instance and being one of the characters out there and then to have the kit that would mm -hmm. be accompanied with your game when you yeah. buy it yeah it's like yeah. Kind yeah. Of also makes me think that we're we talk, we often think about wearables as something adds on to a existing console or existing play but it seems like if you want to actually incorporate bodily experience through wearable you have to start from thinking that part of the gameplay experience as part of the design uh, which goes completely different so i guess that could be the pitfall that many mm -hmm. game commercially try to implement wearables there they just wanted they just made a game but adds on as a wearable mm -hmm. a wearable as add-on rather than we're talking about way more different type of implementations uh design approach in a very start from the get-go with mm -hmm. wearable so that's what mm -hmm. kind of is inspiring in this in this topic at the moment 
Yeah, I, uh, you're right in that sense. I mean, um, there are really advantages and disadvantages of both. Of course, the disadvantage of creating a game around bodily experiences and variables most probably it will be very well integrated, but then it's a lot of work, right? Like you have to invest a lot into that. And if you want to explore those different uh, possibilities that variables will bring, maybe we need more quantity also at the beginning. I think it's important to uh, understand how can we create a balance? Because in one part, we can still add maybe lighter bodily interactions that are still there, that are still changing how you play the game. But of, uh, and increase the quantity. But on the other side, of course, we can also design games that are uh, designed for the get-go for variables that will introduce really unique bodily experiences in that sense. Mm -hmm. And I think bodily experiences that variables can bring uh, exceeds the current existing ones that we do with controllers, for example. Like mm -hmm. even the Pokemon Go example is a very nice one because you have teams and it's somehow of a social experience at the same time, right? I mean, uh, there was a lot of players uh, when I was in Turkey that comes together in parks and meet each other because, you know, everyone is playing Pokemon <laughs> Go at that part because there are Poke stops. Everyone knows that and they're mm -hmm. there. Uh, so variables can be also part of the social interaction signaling from which team you are from or what mm -hmm. kind of Pokemon body you have with you right now, maybe you can even exchange them uh, and give some tokens and memories to people around there. Like even the small ideation can reveal a lot of uh, in different interactions when we look through this lens of the framework that I showed. Um, so yes, I mean, uh, from the get-go, if we can design them, I guess there will be a lot of opportunities but also from the customizable part, from more of a do-it-yourself part, we can still give you glimpses of what variables can bring. Uh, back in the day when we did the Hyperdex project about the hybrid uh, toys and, and games, uh, there it was just there's this huge hype on on these uh, devices and things, and then a lot of the the things that it's it's quite difficult for a digital game maker to make a, a, a physical product. It's an absolutely yeah. different mm. different art and business. To, to be honest, so not all of the all of the companies that were running into this uh, trend, they were not really that great uh, yeah. of doing that or going with it. But I think that what we should to do is that we should look from the not from the the kind of the laws of the uh, digital games business, but we should look at the toys business or mm -hmm. or other kind of the physical, uh, like for instance, there is this huge trend of ugly Christmas shirts and there is <laughs> blinking lights already. There's an electronics is kind of part of the trend in a way. It has nothing to do with triple I gaming, of course, but it is a very much playful way of kind of go around with the, the Christmas garments. So yeah. I'm wondering like maybe kind of, Sometimes when you look at the trends, we too much look from the inside of games and we should just look from the, the other um, phenomena around us, which are much more massive because it's quite difficult to make masses with, with, with devices that feels a bit niche in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then when you look at, for instance, the mass markets of, of these Christmas shirts, they, it's, mm -hmm. not a, it's not a small money business in a way. So simple inter yeah. interactions between the... The family's uh, Christmas shirts, for instance, could be a huge hit in the market. Yeah. Uh, so we don't always cater for the for the uh, kind of uh, enthusiast gamers, but we could uh, cater for the people that would play much more simplistic games with yeah. uh, with the wearables. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think there's a huge range, and uh, most of the games that I, for example, uh, two of the games that I showed were were more of a festival games one of them were a tabletop role-playing game which takes eight hours in one session so this was designed for that kind of gameplay one was for larp that you play outdoors and there are i think uh, kind of different kind of contexts and spaces for every kind of variable and what is also interesting is to think about the rituals around games uh, because i think variables have the potential to be part of them because they are uh, kind of a very, very integrated part of how we are feeling ourselves, right? When we come home, 
then we want to relax, maybe we wear our pajamas. Sometimes we watch a football game and then we go and wear the football kit of the team that we are supporting. And mm. uh, might be interesting also to think games around that. I want to play a game and then maybe I want to play this shirt of the game that maybe have also some kind of function in the game, maybe a small mm. one. But the important part there is not that it's very effective in the game, but it's part of playing ritual. Yeah. So analyzing all those periphery of games. I lost my dog, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. LED t-shirt. Oh, yeah. Games <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know I'm not sure if that goes through the... True that, yeah. But anyway, yeah, so that kind of I, reminds me also. Yeah, that I've seen those like concert uh, <laughs> toys and gadgets, and mm, people yeah. tend to gather up with T-shirts or some sort of like a LED gadgets around uh, in the concert, maybe ears as well, mm, or this kind of a butterfly wing things that you can uh, dance within a festival. I think the festivals right. would be really much uh, the spaces where people put quite a lot of money in their costumes in for festivals yeah. as well. So it, it's not necessarily just a niche uh, kind of um, market because, I, well, nowadays it's absolutely niche because yeah. there is no festivals. Oh, no. <laughs> but I, I just wonder because, well, maybe there is also this like a, a business opportunity for future uh, concerts, future gatherings of people when we still think about the social distancing things. We will come out of this this pandemic era about thinking about the distance with other people much more. Mm -hmm. So there mm -hmm. is a space for creating this kind of bumpy mm -hmm. <laughs> outfits that would kind of uh, give us a sense of more um, safety, uh, yeah. which might not be the, the, the need for anymore, but mm -hmm. the, the kind of the anxiety that has already built for over a year yeah. might be Or really... maybe we have to do vice versa. So people would, for that they would physical touch each contact other. Yeah. and so we can encourage that to, to, towards <laughs> to go back to to the normal well there's like it's it's um, it's kind of interesting how i i didn't think about this at all before your lecture that actually covid isn't quite interesting space for design uh, mm -hmm. with the wearables because there's so many things that can now actually happen and there is a space for disruptive innovations yeah, uh, yeah, for the social activities with wearables that we used to have a huge stigma for, for mm -hmm. all sorts of things around our face. <laughs> and yeah. now it's there's someone that is says in the in the chat actually that reminds me of masks and helmets with animated facial expressions. Could that be part of the socializing in the future? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it gives the space for that kind yeah. of. A, I think that's an that's an exciting space, like yeah. uh, how to alter and create new social expressions uh, through these new modalities, right? And yeah. It also applies that this kind of uh, studies has been done, at, for example, in virtual reality with uh, this bioadaptive technologies to show emotions in different ways. So when you're excited instead of blushing, maybe you start glowing in the virtual <laughs> And something similar can now be adapted because, yeah, our faces are always closed right now. And we were talking to each other. It's hard to show emotions. Mm. And what are the interesting ways of showing them? And actually, one of my friends in University of Lapland was working on that, that they were designing these masks with smileys on and try to mm. understand how people are kind of conceiving the meaning of those. Uh, but yeah, I think they can be definitely a part of it. And a playful intervention from there would be also very interesting. And we don't have to just uh, restrict ourselves with a smile or a crying face. But I don't know, we can do a lot of different things. We can put a monster, a monster a mouth there and, and see how people react. And what what it, what it makes to our social interactions in daily life and how it feels. Uh, yeah, yeah, now we have a space and opportunity to do that. 
I wonder if Ura ring could be part of this as well. Like if you would measure how much mm -hmm. you slept or how do you feel? And then that could be part of the mask uh, kind of interface that shows the other people some information how I'm feeling. <laughs> but there's like so many things already that they are, there's, this has evolved a lot. There's so, like you could just have the, the switch controller and use that as a, as an accelerometer or or any kind of like there's so many sensors around us to uh, yeah. to to yeah. kind of grab and and use in something so yeah. the field was very different 10 years ago uh yeah. and it was just to become and mm -hmm. i think that the the whole covid situation is kind of giving a social push for mm -hmm. for these things yeah. as well so it's yeah. interesting to see what's going to come come, come mm -hmm. out of it mm -hmm. yeah well, i mean for related... oh sorry uh, yeah, for me, I, what is really really interesting about those variables is they transform your body into into your character's body in, in a way. Even 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 if it's partial, it's effective. And I'm so curious how. I mean, now the technology is there. We don't have really too much restrictions in terms of the technology now when it comes to variables. I think it's more of understanding uh, the place of wearing things in our lives uh, and how they can reflect to the games and how they can reflect back from games to our daily lives and uh if we have uh, if, if we can go and push that field a little bit more to understand this symbolism of variables and well, mm -hmm. their meaning and possible experience that they can create uh then i think it will thrive more than it is now but as you said now sensors are everywhere and mm -hmm. i think we are ready to go in that direction in terms of technology we just need to push it also in terms of design. Well, have you been using any brain controllers in your work? Like, I, I don't know what is the status of those these days, mm -hmm. what kind of, how accurate the data they can actually mm -hmm. uh, pull, but uh, but it used to be one of the, the trends uh, in the field to, to to have these concentration games, yeah. for instance, so meditation games. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe, like, yeah, I would love to hear a bit how how is that field going at the moment, if you follow that at all? Yeah, we haven't been used those, but we had actually produced knowledge through experts about how to use those. And mm. they're not still very reliable in, in, in terms of uh, what they are telling to us. So it is very <laughs> easy to, for example, mix two different emotions to each other right. by just looking at the data. Uh, but still, I think uh, they have uh, this opportunity to be integrated into games in one way, one way or another. We don't have to really go and try to pick the most uh, complex brain data. We can still also look ways of heart rate. I mean, it is usually correct, and we don't even know the design patterns around how to use heart rate, for example in games, we can start from that. And we had a lot of good ideas from our workshops, like how we can integrate that. Like one of them was, if you can keep calm, then you yeah. can become invisible in the game, for example. Oh yeah, like a, a biofeedback for, for getting your mm -hmm. body in control by meditating yeah. in the game. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but during the game. So it's not like the aim of the game is not meditating, but to somehow yeah. try to control your body. Mm. So this is what this was just one of the small examples, and there were a lot of like that. And uh, yeah, I think there, there is also promise in that, especially now uh, we all, I mean, most of us uh, can afford at least uh, the lower grade of smartwatches, mm -hmm. then they, they all have those heart rate monitors there. And mm -hmm. I think now there are more opportunities for also mainstream gaming to implement those kind of uh, feedback to games. Yeah. So do we have any questions from the like pre-tasks that would be good to pull here? But interest, the, one of the interesting questions that I wanted to raise from our student is that what was the most craziest, fictional or non-fictional, like real or in fictional, either way, what was the most craziest wearable idea or actual product that you want to point out? Okay. Maybe I, well, some of our students can check those out to brainstorm uh -huh. their ideas. Okay, uh, that's a good question. Craziest. I mean, when you say crazy, I cannot think anything else than this crazy cosplays that they actually work. Like, for example, of course, Iron Man suit is one of them. I don't know if you have come, come up to that, but 
Oh, I've seen a couple of those YouTube videos of yeah, awesome but, Iron Man, yes. But I think what I'm also kind of really more interested in that they designed the costumes of that huge giant characters in the game that also expands your body into a two and a half, three meter giant into the conventions. And uh, these are very crazy for me because they change a lot of, of your perception of how you move your body, how much space you cover in the world, what you can do and what you can't do with your body. And um, with that, I think as an implementation, it's not very crazy, but as a philosophy behind it, it's somehow crazy that there is this um, wig and tails from Doug Swan Swanes. Uh, basically, it's a tail that you can control with your hip movements, and it was designed for a stage performance. But how they look at that very interesting because now you have a new extension on your body. And then uh, if you use it maybe for a day, two days, then what it becomes, like how you start feeling about your body and you can actually control it by moving your hips in different directions. Now you have a tail and how it affects uh, your perception. And it's very also a very interesting question about games that how this perception can be used in playful and humorous and uh, kind of mischievous ways to create new game mechanics. Mm. I get parallel with that maybe some cyborg uh, implementations to body are very interesting. Of course, there's a thin line between on body and in body in that sense. But uh, I think how they work is somehow similar. Uh, it was... I think he was here, the Neil Harbison uh, was here in MindTrack in 2016, and he was mentioning uh, he has a camera in, in his head, uh, like implanted to his brain mm -hmm. that uh, translates the colors into sound because he is mm -hmm. colorblind and he senses colors through sound. And it became a sense for him afterwards, like for 10 years. And uh, he was mentioning the most craziest thing that he wanted to implant, implant a disc around his head. And when this disc gets heated according to the time of the day, so if it is like 12, this part will be heated. If it is three, this part will be heated. Mm. And when it becomes a sense, if he stops it, like if he slows it down, what happens? And would we'll still feel it. Yeah, yeah like uh, if, if the time still flows in the same mm. pace for, for him. Mm. That was, that was a really interesting part of it. I think there's a cool comment from the uh, Twitch chat is that an anonymity brought by masks could also encourage people to wear more daring looks outside. Mm. Uh, that could include variables. And this, uh, this is something I'm really looking forward to. Like, I don't hope that we, we are here for, for more extended time, but it seems like that this is not going that fast. So I, I wonder how much it can kind of end up changing the way that we also wear outside because yeah. we can mask ourselves uh, without any social disturbance. Yeah. That's, I think that's a pretty good comment. And I didn't think about that. But yeah. now I started to think about that, and it's very interesting. And mm. but I have come across some of some interesting costumes outside that is complemented by interesting masks, mm. uh, and I was kind of happy to so see those people to be that flamboyant and courageous with their outfit. Uh, I don't know if it was because of masks, but it actually looked more complete with that interesting mask mm. on, on their face, and. Of course, like it's interesting, right? Even if the COVID situation ends, maybe some people can still prefer to wear masks throughout the day because now uh, it's it's kind of normal to wear them. And for example, one of the reasons that I was using them to cover my face from the cold because I hate wearing mm -hmm. scarves. Uh, and even if I wouldn't go to a market or anything, sometimes I wear them just going outside since it, it feels more warm. So I don't know why not. Maybe it will also be a habit that we can uh, bring along. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's uh, something preferable or not, but I think time will also show. But yeah, only time, time will tell us how this yeah. actually affects. Yeah. Because for instance, I've completely given up wearing my Apple Watch 
because it yeah. makes no sense currently. There's <laughs> there's so little activities for for sure. for that watch to help me out. Okay. <laughs> so the the kind of the world is changing for like individually for us in different ways, like how what yeah. we wear. Uh, or maybe the money that we save from buying all the new shoes or all the new <laughs> other garments are now putting into the flamboyant costumes that we could put on mm -hmm. for the next summer's picnics or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's related to what Anna Kaisa mentioned about the disruptive uh, inventions moment in this. Yeah. This is such a changing moment that mm -hmm. existing wearables such as Apple Watch might not be very useful, but we, we might want to seek out for a different type of interactivity, different mm. type of playfulness that may not be, have been thought of before. Right. Um, but then I also kind of want to mention uh, one of the comments came from the Twitch. There was a question about how to ensure the security and privacy, for example. We mm. also kind of mm -hmm. briefly talked about the heart yeah. rate, brain rate yeah. mm -hmm. uh, on the gameplay. But there is also a very thin layer there that this could be very private, sensible information. Mm -hmm. So maybe the question can be like, are there any this type of ethical issue discussions or what is the guideline or I think what are the line that you think mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. you think the, the guideline for yeah. designers and yeah. wearable designers uh, yeah I think it's a yeah uh, pretty much of a big concern and, and a very important one uh, maybe the most important one when it comes to that because um, it's sensitive data at the end of the day it tells uh, maybe even more about you uh, if, if, if it is somehow uh, processed as a big data that you collect from a lot of people and try to understand. And I find that like we researchers are actually a part of this because uh, we actually had responsibility of approaching all those uh, new technologies also from the critical perspective. Uh, of course, we are trying to maybe imagine uh, better futures. Maybe we can try to imagine how to use this mass data for well-being of people. Maybe try to understand uh, some diseases before they happen or uh, maybe some kind of accidents before they happen. But at the same time, uh, as has been in the uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal, uh, you can never know what they are used for. And mm -hmm. for example, in, in, in one of our papers, we speculated on created transurban cities, cities where transhumans are living. And one of the dystopian scenarios there was if you collect the emotional data of citizens throughout all of their lives, this emotional data can become kind of a currency. And then if you don't have an emotional standard, in terms of how stable you are emotionally, maybe you will not be allowed to play like specific places in the city, and you can only live in this depression hoods that we have we have given to these game, <laughs> these names. And in that sense, uh, I think it's pretty important to maybe engage with also design fiction to understand also dystopian futures and what mm. might be the uh, pitfalls. Uh, but this is was just one of the pitfalls, maybe an extreme one, uh, of cons uh, consecutive and continuous body data uh, collecting. Mm -hmm. um, I think yeah, the best thing, at least as researchers, we can do to reveal those also uh, very dystopic features, along with the utopic ones, of course. I'm not saying that we should be depressive uh, about what happens uh, in, in the future with this new data. Uh, but that's are, for sure there will be problems. We're pretty much already quite uh, risky and daring with sharing our yeah. information by carrying these phones around. Yeah. Um, so there, that's, there's a high risk of the of of those dystopians already become live. So these are kind of wearables already. The the, the iPhones. Yeah. So we yeah. wear them in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the interesting thing here is that now we know what they can collect with iPhone, right? They can collect their voice and there is already targeted uh, ads and we know mm. that it works like that. Uh, but we still don't know what happens if they can collect enough heart rate data or mm. other types of bioadaptive data, like how they can use that, if they can make yeah. remote manage our emotional states with that. We don't know if, mm -hmm. if this is possible, but might be. And that's a danger. And hopefully... Uh, more researchers will be inside of that to intervene if this happens. 
Yeah. And I hope that through playful things, we can disrupt these things as well, because we can kind of disturb the data in a way that it's, it's that we make our own behaviors abnormal. Mm-hmm. And that would kind of, hopefully, I'm not sure if that actually statistically would make any difference, but I'm thinking about like walking for FIFA game, for instance, it might yeah. create something that I wouldn't do normally. Um, mm-hmm. So I hope that the, the the playful realm is can be the anarchist in this in way or one, in, in one way yeah. or another. Um, Definitely, yeah. Right. Uh, okay, I think that there is a there's space for one more question for us and then, then we are out of time. Uh, super exciting kind of futures. I think that we are most of us, most of us are kind of a bit techno, <laughs> techno lovers in a sense that this, this excites us. And well, one question, at least from me, if there is no more others from the chat, is that if somebody would like to now start making their own wearable prototypes and the kind of projects, Oz, what would you recommend to start with? What are, what kind of tools would be kind of easy to uh, access at the moment and easy to learn? Actually, yeah. that was the question that I wanted to raise from the audience. Oh, okay, so, cool. Guys, uh, you nailed it. I, I, I have my brain power here, I guess, yeah. like a telepathic yeah, uh, a lot connection. Yeah, a lot of students <laughs> did ask previously, yeah. even before this lecture, because there are de- yeah. like future game designers themselves as well. So um, where can they start? What are where, they can, where can we start playing? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great question. I mean, the tools that I use uh, usually uh, is actually Arduino. And uh, there are Arduino tools called, for example, Lilipad, which is specifically designed for wearables because uh, they have big holes and you can use conductive threads. So the, there are also these threads that uh, conduct electricity. So you can use them with those. And, um, and Arduino is something easy to learn, actually. So it might be a good place to start. And other fruit uh, is a brand that you can go and look into. They have very good tools and tutorials for integrating electronics to wearables or even just making wearables out of them. Uh, this might be good ways to start. And if you're a little bit into Arduino already, there are other Arduino types called tiny circuits, which is really sort of small circuits, which are important for wearables because while working with wearables, we usually don't have too much space. Uh, so trying to find small uh, kind of microcontrollers to come bringing things uh, to life is important. And I think one of the important thing is also try to understand, maybe just get a piece of cloth and put some electronics on that and look at that, like how they interact. It's not a very mm. easy interaction uh, from the beginning. Uh, but they also create a new expression type, right? Like when you put something hard into something soft, uh, then there are new availabilities that you can do. This can be also one of the things that I can recommend to you. So if you wanna make something that will work, I think Arduino is a good way to go, but uh, also to understand how things can be on our body and on our clothes and on our uh, dresses, try to also make them it doesn't mean it doesn't matter if they work or not but try to carry on them on your body and see how it feels mm. uh, and how can you shape them in different ways uh, this might be also uh, a method that i can uh, give as a tip and maybe for some students if you're not that into making that kind of uh, arduino projects maybe just to saw in the switch controller in your shoulder mm-hmm. or something like that this is quite mm-hmm. easy already to to yeah. include to your game just tap on the mm-hmm. buttons in, yeah. on your shoulder so yeah, there's, that's also there's so a, many things to start hacking with that's a super good uh i think recommendation like uh it's so it's so tiny so it's it's possible yeah it. yeah and it's it's also in an easy way to understand what happens if you have a switch controller in your feet and you're trying to play a game by pushing buttons in your feet, and that mm. will also create awareness about how to use your body. Mm-hmm. Cool. I think also very multidisciplinary collaborations between game designers and maybe the fashion designers, wearable, mm-hmm. fashion, uh, electronic, fabric mm-hmm. designers. They could come together and 
work on the gamifying experience yeah. of this fabric. I guess this definitely draws more attention to being open-minded, multidisciplinary approach when making games. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. And I think it's very needed, especially for variable design, because for example, I'm an industrial product designer and I don't have too much of a practice with working soft materials. That's why we also have a fashion designer, a PhD student in our team. That's why we also have electronic engineer in our team again, so mm -hmm. we can connect these different minds to each other for creating new and revolutionary, hopefully playful experiences with variables. As a last note, Oz, where can we follow you so that we know what, what you are working on? Okay, uh, yeah, well, my website, of course, uh, is not very, very current right now, <laughs> but it's again a good place to watch what I'm doing. But I think the best place, especially currently, is to maybe follow gamification groups pages because we are pretty active of advertising what we have done and what's going on in our group. And you can also come across with other uh, interesting research from there. Excellent. Thank you all so much for your uh, lecture. And uh, for our students, thank you for joining the session today. All the viewers in the Twitch and maybe the people that watch this after we've streamed and put it on our YouTube channel. So make sure that you follow all our social media channels as well to, to kind of check these cool lectures that we put together and have our guests to share, our, share their insights. Um, next week we have a game jam coming up, so make sure that you go to the Games Now uh, Alto FI website to check more details when the registration will be opened. Um, any other things to remind before we go bye bye? <laughs> Well, I think we covered most of them. Just like Anna Kaiser said, we have online game jam coming up yet again. And another Games Now lecture is also scheduled in April. So stay tuned for that. And the best way to stay in touch with us is our social media, which probably you've seen them upper and layer up there. <laughs> So yeah, that was Games Now. And I think this is a great time to wrap up and thanking everyone for joining us. Join the Discord channel. Bye. Bye. See you next time. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.